Good morning. Welcome to morning prayer with the sermon and uh, happy Thanksgiving as well. Uh, this morning, our uh, propers will be taken as we've been doing, taking the collect epistle and gospel from the Thanksgiving Eucharistic service. And we'll be using those uh, beginning on page 265. And they will be used as our morning prayer uh, lessons. That means morning prayer begins on page 5 this morning, not 3. If you notice on page 5, the last two sentences there uh, are Thanksgiving uh, opening sentences. We'll start with those. We go immediately over to page 7. When we come to our psalm, you'll notice also for, uh, instead of the venite, which is usually said as our morning prayer canticle, uh, this time some 140 or por portions of 147 are read as the canticle. So we will read all of 147 as our psalm this morning. That's found on page 522. Our epistle, of course, epistle and gospel there begin on page 265. So if you want to mark your page for that, or just I will also provide slides as usual. Uh, that will be a reading from James chapter 1, verses 16 through 34. And then the gospel will be on page 266, Matthew chapter 6, uh, chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. So with all of those uh, numbers there before you and your book, your prayer book marked, we are ready to begin. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth, by understanding hath he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths are broken up, and the clouds drop down the dew. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. O oh, praise the Lord, for it is a good thing to sing praises unto our God. Yea, a joyful and pleasant thing it is to be thankful. The Lord doth build up Jerusalem and gather together the outcast of Israel. He healeth those that are broken in heart and giveth medicine to heal their sickness. He telleth the number of the stars and calleth them all by their names. Great is our Lord and great is his power. Yea, and his wisdom is infinite. The Lord setteth up the meek and bringeth the ungodly down to the ground. O oh, sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving, sing praises upon the harp unto our God, who covereth the heaven with clouds and prepareth rain for the earth, and maketh the grass to grow upon the mountains and herb for the use of men, who giveth fodder unto the cattle and feedeth the young ravens that call upon him. He hath no pleasure in the strength of a horse, neither delighteth he in any man's legs. But the Lord's delight is in them that fear him and put their trust in his mercy. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise thy God, O Zion. For he hath made fast the bars of thy gates and hath blessed thy children within thee. He maketh peace in thy borders and filleth thee with the flour of wheat. He sendeth forth his commandment upon earth and his word runneth very swiftly. He giveth snow like wool and scattereth the hoarfrost like ashes. Casteth forth his ice like morsels, who is able to abide his frost? He sendeth out his word and melteth them. He bloweth with his wind and the waters flow. He showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and ordinance unto Israel. He hath not dealt so with any nation, neither hath the heathen knowledge of his laws. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The epistles written in the first chapter of the epistle of St. James the Apostle, beginning at the 16th verse. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. 
But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Here endeth the epistle. We praise thee, O God. We acknowledge thee to be the Lord. All the earth doth worship thee, the Father everlasting. To thee all angels cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers therein. To thee cherubim and seraphim continually do cry, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of the majesty of thy glory. The glorious company of the apostles praise thee. The goodly fellowship of the prophets praise thee. The noble army of martyrs praise thee. The holy church throughout all the world doth acknowledge thee. The Father of an infinite majesty, thine adorable, true, and only Son, also the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. Thou art the King of glory, O Christ. Thou art the everlasting Son of the Father. When thou tookest upon thee to deliver man, thou didst humble thyself to be born of a virgin. When thou hadst overcome the sharpness of death, thou didst open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Thou sittest at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. We believe that thou shalt come to be our judge. We therefore pray thee, Help thy servants, whom thou hast redeemed with thy precious blood. Make them to be numbered with thy saints in glory everlasting. O Lord, save thy people and bless thine heritage. Govern them and lift them up forever. Day by day we magnify thee, and we worship thy name ever, world without end. Vouchsafe, O Lord, to keep us this day without sin. O Lord, have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us. O Lord, let thy mercy be upon us as our trust is in thee. O Lord, in thee have I trusted. Let me never be confounded. The Holy Gospel is written in the sixth chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew, beginning at the 25th verse. Jesus said, Be not anxious for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than food and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by being anxious, can add one cubit unto the measure of his life? And why are ye anxious for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore... If God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore be not anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? After all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Be not therefore anxious for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. It would seem that more and more the times that we are living in are really revealing to us more about what God is doing. They reveal to us more and more the relevance and the importance of what we read in Scripture. These times reveal more and more to us the need, really, to continue to orient our thinking in ways that bring glory to God and, of course, bring comfort and assurance to our troubled minds. Each time we hit that proverbial wall and we think that we are at our wit's end, a new day arises, a day which we should acknowledge the Lord has made. And then we read again something. He provides something that pulls us back from the edge, calms us, and sets our minds and our hearts right. Those who are uh, very astute 
might have noticed this morning that instead of the Venite for morning prayer, the uh, a large portion of Psalm 147 is assigned instead. And so we, uh, if you've read it, uh, is this not a most fitting psalm for today? What an appropriate psalm for us to be reading at a time like this when thanksgiving to God is to be in our hearts and our minds. This psalm today really captures so much of what we are to be thinking about today and what we are to be thankful for. The last five psalms in the book of Psalms, the, the Psalter, are all thanksgiving psalms, praising, call, calling us to praise God, praise the Lord. Not in the way that we think of as a, as a national holiday, but a way to express sincere thanksgiving to God directly, which is to be our primary aim, to thank God, to glorify God, <clears throat> since as St. James today says that all good and perfect gifts come from him. This psalm incites, in us, incites us to praise God in two ways, or for two reasons. First, we praise God for his power, uh, his display of power, goodness, excellency, wisdom, all these attributes of perfection that God shows forth, and for all the ways in which God governs and rules the world around us we live in, for all of the ways that he provides for us. And we are prone, of course, not to see this much of the time, as our abundance, the abundance that we have here, <clears throat> many times brings along with it a sort of a blindness or a laziness, uh, a desensitizing in seeing that the source of all things that we have is in fact God. And secondly, in this psalm, we give thanks to God for the way in which he defends and protects and grows his church, for his gracious care and, and, and how he nourishes the church, especially when it's persecuted and, and suffering and going through difficult times. The psalmist begins by saying this morning, <clears throat> praise the Lord, begins right off the, out the gate. Praise the Lord, it is pleasant and fitting to sing praises to God. So immediately our singing to God is fitting and praising God is fitting. It's appropriate, it's meet and right so to do. He begins by giving a small example by saying, praise the Lord, he does it himself, and then we're, go, then we're told that it's fitting and right to do so. So we, all, of course, should follow in the footsteps there, follow that example. That's how it begins. But then, he goes, but then he goes on. He says, the Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. Now, quite possibly, this psalm was written at the end of the Babylonian captivity. The people of God had been carried away into captivity, as we know, by the Babylonians, and as they returned after a long time, it would have been right to first give thanks to God for their rescue. And as Jerusalem was being rebuilt, even more so. God showed a special mercy toward his people in those days. He chose them as a special people out of all the nations of the earth. He chose them as his own, showing how he would continue to choose men from all walks of life to be members of his church. <clears throat> he set a fixed place where people would come to find him, and that is the city of Jerusalem. And yet we should, ourselves should be looking beyond just the physical structure of the city or even the physical structure of the temple where God would dwell. We should be thinking here more about how God chose a people to, to worship there, more than just a piece of land, but a people who would dwell in it. That's what's more important to him. And this includes us, of course. This includes the church today. We are God's temple. We are God's building. We are his workmanship. And we are, his, we are the living stones in this temple that he's building up. And he does not forsake the work of his own hands. <clears throat> he continues his work today as well with us. As God continues to call people to the, into the church, calls people unto himself, he also continues to promise us remind us that there is a land for us that we will dwell in. This land in the perfect sense is, of course, is still a distance away. It's not in its final state because Christ has not returned and uh, he's not completed all things. <clears throat> but we can, of course, and should be thankful for the, the good land that we are living in right now. That is one of the things, the things we do at Thanksgiving. We give thanks to God for our nation, for our freedoms, and the land that he's placed us in to sort of live out those freedoms. But our eyes should always be looking just over that horizon to what is to come as well, because it doesn't end here. <clears throat> There's a land over the horizon where the church dwells in perfection, 
and unity and peace. Whereas we are now divided, scattered, persecuted in many places, wandering, later all things will be restored to their full, uh, the fullness of their design and intent. Next, the psalmist says, God heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Those few words should bring to mind Christ. This is shown to us in the life of Christ as he works miracles, and preaches and teaches. He came to bind up the brokenhearted with a, with a message of salvation. Set free captives, captives to sin, slavery to sin. Heal our wounds of separation from God. A future perfection, again, to thank God for and to look forward to. Next, he says, he goes, he expands out a little bit here. He says, he determines, God determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power, and his understanding is beyond measure. So as we continue now to, now to expand our scope here, to look further and further out into space and understand better its size and scope, the psalmist is doing the same thing. And we in, in the, there we can see that it's more and more past our understanding as we do look through the telescope. Uh, we see here that God is able to keep track of this universe and keep track of a name and number each and every star that's out there in the universe. And so if he's able to do such a thing, such a feat as that, to number and to know every star, its location, its size, its weight, and how much easier, we might, might ask, is it then to convert unregenerate souls? How much easier is it for God to manage his creation, to keep us for the day of salvation, and to give us everything that we need in the meantime? So again, the psalmist says, sing to the Lord with thanksgiving, make melody to our God on the lyre. Again, we are called to praise God here, praise the Lord with thanksgiving. And this, if you notice this every few verses, this call to praise the Lord is sort of acting like a chorus would in a song. We're exhorted to praise God, and then we hear about a few of his wondrous works. And then like a repeating chorus, we're called once again, praise the Lord with thanksgiving. This is sort of the, the, the style and model of, of Hebrew poetry. And then back we go to the words, the works of God. He covers the, what does he do next? He brings it down closer to home. He covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. So God is a provider. God is a provider of all that we need, even with the weather and the land and the animals around us. God is providing clouds and rain watering the earth, bringing forth plants for harvesting and to eat, for bringing water for us to drink, for the animals to drink. So thanksgiving, of course, is right for his provision. Even to the animals, God provides their needs. How much more will he provide and has he provided for us? In, in fact, in our gospel, part of the gospel this morning, Matthew chapter 6, look at the birds of the air, Jesus says. Look at the birds of the air, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? We have all of the science that tells us how clouds are formed and how rain is produced, how all of these things work in the world. And yet the psalmist tells us that God is the source of all of these things. One commentator says philosophers discover the origin of rain and the elements. And it is not denied that clouds are formed from the gross vapors which are exhaled from the, the earth and the sea. But second causes, this is important, second causes should not prevent us from recognizing the providence of God in furnishing the earth with the moisture needed for fructification, unquote. So God is a God of provision, he's saying. He brings the clouds, he brings the rain and the sun and the wind as he sees fit for us and for our needs. And then in turn, they bring forth for us the food that we need. The secondary causes. The focus of our call it today, to get our minds fixed on what we are thankful for, it does mention the husbandman, it does mention the farmer, as well as the fruits of the earth, the bounty, and the land yielding its increase. So in all of creation, what is provided for us to live and to breathe and to eat and to drink is all sourced in God. And then he goes on. 
Next, he says, his delight, God's delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. So we are called to be thankful to God in all that he creates. And yet, God's greater desire is taking pleasure in those who fear him and who hope in his steadfast love and who hope in his salvation. Again, the chorus comes around again. Here was the chorus. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. And then again, back into the, back into the provisions. Verse 13, he strengthens the bars of the gates, of your gates. He blesses your children within you. Now he's into the city. He's gone from the, 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 the universe, the cosmos, to the earth, the sky, and now into the city. He makes peace in your borders, talking about the land. He fills you with the finest of wheat. He sends out his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He scatters frost like ashes, hurls down his crystals of ice like crumbs. Who can stand before his cold? He sends out his word and melts them. He makes his wind blow and the waters flow. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and rules to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know his rules. And then what does he close with? The chorus, praise the Lord. So our psalm this morning takes us through this sort of long journey, this long litany of the many ways that God provides for us. All things come from God. Some are to please us. Some are given to sustain us and nourish us. Some are to show us a glimpse of God's power and awesomeness. Some are sent by God, in fact, even to chastise us and to correct us when, we're, when we go astray or to call us back to him. But they are all there and they all work together for those who love God and praise his holy name. But we would be remiss if we were to leave out the greatest thing that we are to praise God for and to be thankful for, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation that we have in him. In one of the prayers of thanksgiving, we give God thanks for our health, our friends, our food, and our raiment, and all the other comforts and conveniences of life. That satisfies it all. Health, friends, food, raiment, and all the other comforts and conveniences of life. But he goes on to say this, but above all, above all, we give thanks for God's mercy in sending his only son into the world to redeem us from sin and eternal death. That is what we are to be, that is what we are to be most thankful for this day and every day. All other things are important. They're all important to, for, to, for us to live by, but they're transitory. All of the things given to us are given to use, but they're not to distract us from the one who has given them to us in the first place. We cannot forget the giver. We might close with some final words here from that same prayer. Seems to be fitting. We ask God this day then that he would give us a due sense of all his mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful. An unfeignedly thankful heart is one that no matter what, it is always striving to be fixed, inexhaustibly working, and thinking about God and how he supplies us with everything that we need and thanking him for all that he supplies us. And in doing so, we may show forth his praise. As we recognize these gifts, we then show forth God's praise. Not only, it says, not only with our lips, but in our hearts, but in our lives. Not only with our lips, but in our lives. By giving up ourselves to his service and by walking before him in holiness and righteousness all the days of our life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a mighty salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us to perform the mercy promised to our forefathers and to remember his holy covenant, to perform the oath which he sware to our forefather Abraham that he would give us, that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation unto his people 
for the remission of their sins. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us and grant us thy salvation. O God, make clean our hearts within us, and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. O most merciful Father, who hast blessed the labors of the husbandman in the returns of the fruits of the earth, we give thee humble and hearty thanks for this thy bounty, beseeching thee to continue thy loving kindness to us, that our land may still yield her increase to thy glory and our comfort, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries through the might of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by thy governance, may be righteous in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Governor, whose glory is in all the world, we commend this nation to thy merciful care, that being guided by thy providence, we may dwell secure in thy peace. Grant to the President of the United States and to all in authority wisdom and strength to know and to do thy will. Fill them with a love of truth and righteousness and make them ever mindful of their calling to serve this people in thy fear. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, from whom cometh every good and perfect gift, send down upon our bishops and other clergy and upon the congregations committed to their charge the healthful spirit of thy grace. And that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our advocate and mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. O God, the creator and preserver of all mankind, We humbly beseech thee for all sorts and conditions of men, that thou wouldest be pleased to make thy ways known unto them, thy saving health unto all nations. More especially we pray for thy holy church universal, that it may be so guided and governed by thy good spirit, that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth, and hold the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace, and in righteousness of life. Finally, we commend to thy fatherly goodness all those who are anyways afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or estate, that it may please thee to comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings and a happy issue out of all their afflictions. And this we beg for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we then unworthy servants do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, 
preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and dost promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant the requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you.